If you look up on the horizon, you see millions of firsters, and they're ready to ride down into the valley and help us. And the reason I think they have a real advantage is that they've built a robot. And the robot is a natural thing. Because in that robot, every bit of the laws of nature are followed exactly. Mother Nature applies all of her rules all the time. 130 pounds of epistemological perfection. And I believe it's very clear that we're going to be helped when we have a few generations of people who stand with one leg in understanding the universe and one leg in understanding self and society. I was an odd mix because I was a Boy Scout and I collected butterflies and did science fair projects uh, and I played football. I didn't fit in a particular slot. I grew up in a very small town in Louisiana and both my mother and father were great mentors. My father was the creative mentor. He was a terrible businessman because we were always very, very broke. We never owned a house, but his shop was a welding and general repair shop. So dad built things all the time and I worked with him all the time. When I was a junior in high school, my uncle gave me a 1947 Dodge sedan. I told Dad that I think I want to make a hot rod out of it. He thought for a minute and said, well, okay, Scooter, if you want to do that, I'll help you. But um, if you start it, you got to finish it. In that process, I think I learned probably as much engineering as I did in engineering school because there was a lot of things to do with very limited resources. We give each one of them a kit of materials. The students call it a bag of junk, but we spent quite a bit of time thinking about what's in the kit. The task is really to grab this peg and try to put it into that square hole. I was terrified of the 270 class. <laughs> the, I mean, the whole idea of getting a box of random parts and turning it into a robot was absolutely terrifying. Ready? Get set? Go! Christina races toward the top in pursuit of another quick victory. Tony fires his arm, and he wins. One of the things that I learned in the lab in 270 was the way to design is to iterate and to start and play and experiment. And I think that Woody did that in his life as well. All you need to do is go down and just drill big holes in those until you're okay. I'm devoted to the notion that it's not about lecturing at, it's about working with. And this is where the lanyard's gonna be attached and that'll be stretched out so it pulls it hard. He's really very much about a collaborative conversation that the students and the faculty are having and getting the faculty into a mentoring position. I talk about teaching, but I don't think it's really teaching. I think it's helping other people learn. Saying that you're teaching implies a push. And I think a pull is a better way to think about it. He never presented himself as the expert. He was the guide or the shepherd to try to help you find the right answer. I would like you to have a very vivid picture <laughs> of what can happen. And that almost went through a three quarter inch piece of plywood. And I didn't talk to rubber bands very far. He wanted people to love what they were doing and work together with each other and be in community and not fighting with each other. And so he always instilled this wonderful sense of kindness and community and collaboration. Woody was not about the conventional. He was always seeing the possibilities that we couldn't see. Be yourself, be weird, and uh, sneakers are always okay. <laughs> Once you take a job, the chances that you will have to reinforce your own creative self-image are pretty slim because the stakes get to be really high. While you're a student, you have a safe opportunity to learn about your ability to be creative. He had the saying, get to be friends with a pit in your stomach. Practice believing six impossible things before breakfast. 
Woody was an extraordinary innovator around accelerating more of humanity to be able to use all of its talent, have more people include their technical self forward, their design self forward, their collaborative self forward, and be in teamwork. He had a way of setting an example that propagated well beyond MIT to other institutions, ultimately to other countries. People were moved and motivated by his practice. He wanted us to celebrate the feats of the mind as much as we celebrated sports that were feats of the body. And it wasn't just that anyone can design, but that design should be for everyone. I think there's a whole bunch of kids out there that are customizing motorcycles who would be unbelievably good engineers if they could get over the symbolic manipulation hurdle of calculus. What Woody made me realize is that it's not about students learning equations. That's important. Students need to be rigorous and understand how to model things, etc. It's about students feeling empowered to create. Are you joyful? Do you feel purpose in life? These are the questions that, whether he did it deliberately or explicitly, they would come out. Sometimes he would send me photographs from his latest trip to Africa or wherever. He's a great photographer. He has the ability to inspire. He influenced many of us to start our own enterprise, our own business. When people talk about flipped classrooms, when people talk about blended learning, in many ways, those are all echoes of things Woody's been saying for decades. I will forever see the ponytail and the smile, although he may be gone.